Hello, good morning. Welcome to Wake Up with Ashland. My name is Eric Brooks. I am, your cur I am the curator here at Ashland, and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning uh, for Wake Up with Ashland. I want to take a minute to thank Dupree Mutual Funds for their continued support of this series. It's made it possible for us to bring it to you for the last, well, we're getting on about five months now, and we've been very pleased to do that. And we are pleased to be able to continue to do that. Uh, so thanks to them for their support. Um, if you haven't visited our website lately, I invite you to do so. Uh, we've added a lot of content, especially about the women of Ashland. Well worth a look. Uh, a lot of artifacts and information are there. Uh, we also have a new In the News tab. Um, that tab features stories that have been in news publications or in the news otherwise of late. So you can check out what's going on in the press. Um, just a lot going on on the website. Um, obviously, as always, please take note of the donate button. Um, certainly appreciate all of your support. Um, it's helped us get through this difficult time, so uh, we appreciate that. It looks like we got a lot of people watching, and I'm glad to see that. Good morning, Shirley. Sue. Sue is our, my volunteer assistant curator. <laughs> She's actually done a lot of work on the subject we're going to discuss today. Michelle, Vicki Mattingly. There are a lot of people here. Jennifer, Camille. Diana, Diana's one of our volunteers, so thank you all for watching. Today we're going to talk about Madeline McDowell Breckenridge, and we've talked about Madge a number of times, uh, and it's really, she's really a subject we can't talk about too much. She's a very, very important individual here at Ashland. Uh, when Nanette McDowell Bullock created the Henry Clay Memorial Foundation, she created the foundation to preserve the legacy of her great-grandfather Henry Clay, but also to preserve the legacy of her sister, Madge. Madge was an, a leader not only locally uh, or on the state level, but both nationally and internationally in uh, the fight for women's suffrage. Uh, very, very important leader, um, very instrumental in that right becoming part of the Constitution. We are approaching some important dates relative to that. Uh, next Tuesday, the 18th, will be the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment by the state of Tennessee. And the importance of that is that Tennessee was the 36th state to ratify the amendment, which meant that enough states had ratified it that it would then become part of the Constitution. That happened on August 26th, 1920. The uh, legislature, our federal legislature, certified the amendment uh, as having been ratified, and it became part of the Constitution at that point. From that point on, women have had the right to vote. So we're coming right up on the centennial, and we wanted to feature Madge as we approach that. We'll hopefully do some additional programming in the next week or so that will feature that. So stay tuned to our social media and to our web page for further information about that. Um, there'll be more forthcoming. So today we're going to look at Madge in a little different way. We've looked at her room in the past. We've looked at her desk. Uh, talked about her as part of the women's tour, which incidentally is being offered every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Sue Andrew uh, is conducting those tours. Um, it's a really neat tour that looks at Ashland through the lens of nine different women who lived and worked here. Um, it's a fascinating story. So if you've never taken that tour, this is a good opportunity to do that. We'll be offering it at 4 p.m. Wednesdays through August uh, at least. So take advantage of it um, and learn that really amazing story. But today, we're going to look at Madge through an exhibit we did. Uh, we do changing exhibits once or twice a year. This one's actually been in now a little over a year, and we'll be here till the end of the year. Um, because of the pandemic, it's not been something we've been able to have featured the way we kind of hoped. But we'll look at some of the artifacts today and talk a little bit about Madge and about suffrage. Uh, most of the artifacts that you're going to see today are from the University of Kentucky. About 1991, the Henry Clay Memorial Foundation transferred to UK all of the papers that had aggregated at Ashland over the years. And there were lots of papers covering multiple generations of the family. And we did that because we're not a research institution. We are a museum. We display artifacts. We interpret artifacts. We do tours. But we're not really a research repository. They are. 
Um, so we have an arrangement where we can use that material in, in any way we want pretty much at any time, but they house it so it can be made available to other scholars. And it's a great arrangement. It works very effectively. We also have a few pieces today from the Kentucky Historical Society and some items from our collection as well. So and a lot of this stuff has never been exhibited before. Uh, we were really pleased to bring it out because it's never been seen. So we want to show you that today. So let's step over here to case number one. This looks at the early life of Madge. I'll start with that picture right there. That's Madge uh, at about 10 years of age. Uh, she was 10 when they moved into Ashland and, or bought Ashland in 1882, born on May 20th, 1872. So that's Madge as a little girl. Uh, that's from UK. There's Madge at the age of 14. One neat thing about this picture is that you can see she's cut her hair short, which at that time would have been fairly unusual for a girl. Most girls wore their hair long, and it was kind of an act of rebellion. So it's a beginning of this rebellious spirit in her, this independence that she would have the rest of her life. Uh, that's the Madge and her sisters, Nettie and Julia. Um, you can see them there together. We have a number of pictures of them there together. Um, that's a very nice one. Um, so, very important picture. We have Madge's report cards, which is kind of neat. She was a very good student uh, at several different schools, both here locally and elsewhere. Um, if you look at this one, I don't know if you can see those grades or not, but the grades are very good. The lowest grade on there is an 88, and that's in Latin. So I guess if you're going to have a subject, it's not your best, a dead language is a good one to have. Uh, Madge was educated uh, at a school called Miss Porter's School, which is in Farmington, Connecticut. It's a very prominent school. It still exists. Uh, it still educates uh, young women uh, and typically women of the upper class. I mean, you have to be fairly wealthy to go to Miss Porter's. Uh, John, uh, Jacqueline Kenny, Kennedy was a graduate of Miss Porter's. So that's Madge's room. You can see a lot like a lot of student rooms today at boarding schools or colleges all of her things. And this is a scrapbook that she kept showing a number of the sites at the school. Uh, that's her class there at the school. See them all assembled in front of the building. Um, so she was a student of German. Let's see if I can get, capture that. That's, she was in a German club here in Lexington and there are a number of other prominent young women from a number of prominent families in that club. And this is their uh, 19, 1892 German club event. So she was a part of that. She was very well read. That's her book plate. Uh, even a writer. This is an article she wrote on her great-grandfather, Henry Clay, in the Century Illustrated Magazine. This was a nationally published publication. This is her father's copy. It contains the article on Clay, which is a fascinating article about him and about his life. And it's got some really great drawings that we've used in a number of locations here at Ashland. And that's uh, from our collection Madeline McDowell married Deshay Breckenridge. That's Deshay. I always thought he was kind of a dapper looking dude. Um, this is a picture from a little later in life. This is their wedding uh, announcement, their wedding invitation. Um, the wedding was in 1898, Thursday, November the 17th. It was a small affair as compared especially to her sister Nanette. And the reason for that is that her father was very ill and she didn't feel like she could have a very large wedding because of her father's illness. Good morning to everyone. I see we've got a lot of people watching today. I appreciate that. So, thanks for tuning in. Come over here. Uh, Madge was a progressive reformer, um, and a lot of that came from a woman who became a close relative. This is Madge's sister-in-law, Sofa Nisba, Breckenridge, that's a fun name for you. Um, she lived in Chicago. She was the first woman admitted to the Kentucky Bar. Uh, she also had a doctorate in, uh, I believe, sociology and social work. Became a very prominent social worker with Jane Addams. And here's a letter. Uh, she's trying to convince Madge to become a social worker. Madge did go to Chicago and spend time with uh, Sophie and Isabel, and this inspired a lot of her work. She also got to meet Jane Adams of Hull House. This is a letter uh, to Madge from Jane Adams, um, and they shared ideas, um, and talked about various social causes. Um, public health was a big cause of Madge's. 
This is from the Public Health Nursing Association. Um, this particular document, uh, something that Madge was a vice, second vice president, third vice president of, um, but again, an uh, entity that advocated for public health. Uh, she uh, helped found a health camp for children. You know, she was concerned about children, particularly in the inner city, who maybe didn't get exercise regularly, didn't get the opportunity to get out and enjoy fresh air in the country and whatnot. That camp still exists, now run by the Y. Um, she was a member of the Lexington Women's Club, one of the early members of that organization, and a member as a result of the National Women's Club. Um, here's a publication of that that belonged to Madge. Um, she was a champion of something called the Lincoln School, and this school served an area called Irish Town. Irish Town, if you take Main Street through town, was south of Main Street and west of Newtown Pike, or thereabouts. Uh, and it was an area that was relatively impoverished. Uh, she did a lot of work there. This document, she actually went to every house in Irish Town and documented the family that lived there and all of the conditions under which they lived. Did they have running water? Did they have electricity? Were any, either of the parents unemployed? Were there children in the home? Were the children going to school? Were the parents educated? So she had all this data that she could use to identify needs to help the people that lived in that community. And one of the ways she did that was through the Lincoln School, which was both a K-12 school, but also a community center. And these are pictures of it. I don't know if you can see some of those. Those are the kids on the roof of the Lincoln School in the winter. You can see all the ice. And that's a sketch of a build, the building for it. Uh, that was done by Magdalene Harvey McDowell, uh, Madge's aunt. She was an architect self-taught she worked with Madge on a number of projects this is one of my favorite photos I discovered this doing the exhibit that is a photo of some women bathing a child you can see him in the tub there and there's another child a couple of other children one is being dried and that's Madge she's actually drying that kid's head so Madge wasn't just someone who who advocated for big ideas she was out there doing the work I mean she was out there doing in the trenches, doing the day-to-day the -day regular work. So uh, it's really neat that that is the case. I and mean, it's neat to see her caught in action like that. That, I think, is just a really amazing picture. Well, of course, we think of Madge, we think of suffrage, um, and that was her primary cause. She was a member of CARA, the Kentucky Equal Rights Association, um, which was the state organ one of the state organizations advocating uh, for the right to vote for women, she became the president of this organization, and this is sort of an outline of what they were proposing to do. She wrote widely. This is an article she wrote in the newspaper. Uh, this one contains probably her most famous quote, Kentucky women are not idiots, even though they are closely related to Kentucky men. And it was a letter to the governor. Um, at this point, this was during World War I. Uh, all the men had pretty much gone off to war, and then women were being expected to step up and fill the roles vacated by those men. And they were, so they were doing the work of society, yet they were not being given the opportunity to vote or have a voice in the way that society went. And Madge was just incensed at that idea. So uh, anyway, uh, she wrote that letter. It's one of a number of letters that she wrote. Women in Kentucky were first granted uh, suffrage in uh, school board elections. And this is uh, an article about that. Uh, later on, of course, they received suffrage in all elections. This is a really neat piece. This is a broadside advertising a speech. You can see here, this is Deshae, Deshae Breckenridge. That was her husband's name. Notice under that, it says, of Kentucky, granddaughter of Henry Clay. Well, she was actually a great-granddaughter, so a little mistake there. But the important thing is that it mentions Henry Clay. And she frequently would bring Henry Clay up or use Henry Clay to gain attention and respect. That she was a, a descendant of his made for a powerful attractant for these kinds of things. And you can see here she's discussing the subject suffrage question. I'm not sure where Coates Hall is. I have yet to identify exactly where this was. Um, or exactly what Monday night at 8 o'clock, but it is nevertheless a neat broadside um, that shows that she was a widely sought-after speaker. This document is probably going to be hard to see. Uh, this document is about, it says, the solution to the race problem. Race was an issue in women's suffrage. Uh, many women, particularly in the South, uh, were concerned that if suffrage were granted to women, that it would vastly enhance the ability of African Americans 
uh, to vote and have a voice in their government. They didn't weren't uh, in favor of that. So many suffragists responded to that by saying, well, if you give women the right to vote, the vast majority of those women will be white. Thus, it will dilute the African-American vote. Now, Madge didn't particularly support that idea. Um, she was willing to accept the argument if it meant getting the vote for women. And part of that was because she thought, ultimately, that if women were granted the right to vote, that uh, it would benefit all races. Everybody would be better off. So she thought the ultimate goal justified, to some degree, certain means. Now, she was an advocate for African Americans. Um, she did not advocate for full equality. She wasn't willing to take on the question of suffrage or uh, uh, segregation because she doesn't, didn't think she could win that battle and didn't want it to perhaps detract from other fights that she was engaging. But nonetheless, she supported a great deal, um, support for African Americans, um, advocacy for their needs, etc. And in fact, when she died, they actually wrote a testimonial to her in the paper. So, an important part of her life. This is a, a, a publication of the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Madge became uh, vice president of this organization and at one time was thought might become president, one of the major national organizations um, that supported the right to vote for women. Uh, and this is their national publication. We have some items here that were worn by women and used by women to advocate for the right to vote. That's a pin, a writing pin. I could see Madeline using a pin like that. She wrote a lot. This is from our collection. We actually have several of these. There's another one on the other side of the case. We have one upstairs in, in Madge's room on a dress that probably belonged to her sister but could have belonged to her. It just says votes for women. You can buy reproductions of that in the museum store in a variety of ways. And that's a very common button worn to support the uh, idea of women's suffrage. This button is from the collections of the Kentucky Historical Society, as is the pen that I showed you there. And this button is important because of the colors. You can see that it's got votes for women and that it's got a ribbon that is green, white, and purple. Now, the general colors for women's suffrage were white, gold, and purple. But this particular ribbon represents a smaller subset of women who are advocating for the right to vote. These women were willing to take more aggressive means, civil disobedience, uh, hunger strikes, even violence if necessary to attain the right to vote for women. Madge was not one of these women generally, although she accepted the possibility that such action may be necessary. Um, you probably are familiar with the terms suffragist and suffragette. It is important to understand the distinction. Suffragist is the general and normal term for anyone advocating for the right to vote for women, and it could apply to men, although usually it conjures up images of women. The term suffragette is a derogatory term. It was applied to the women who wore ribbons like this, who advocated more violent approaches. Um, so when you use that term, you're making a pejorative statement about a group of women because of the strategies they were employing. Um, and that's an important thing to understand. There's a movie called uh, Suffragette, which came out in 2015. Uh, that movie is basically about these women in Britain. And one of the characters in that movie is a woman named Emmeline Pankhurst, who is a real woman, a real advocate for the right to vote for women, um, very vocal in Britain. Uh, Madge actually brought Emmeline Pankhurst to Kentucky and to Ashland. So that's how well connected she was. If you see that movie, Emmeline Pankhurst is played by Meryl Streep. So um, you might want to check that out. This photograph comes from KHS. This is a really, really important image, unfortunately. It's on our website, so you may want to just go there to see it. But um, it is an image of Governor Morrow. He's seated there. He is signing the ratification of the 19th Amendment on January the 6th of 1920. So we were an early state, not the first, but an early state in ratifying the amendment. And all of these women around him are suffragists, and they're wearing their votes for women ribbons. Madge is right behind him. You can see her there. And above her, looking down on it all, is a bust of Henry Clay. A bust to date I have not found, but I very much would like to find that. So anyway, uh, that's a really neat image, and it's in their collection. Uh, like I say, I believe we have that on the website now, so you can go check it out, zoom in on it in more detail if you wish to do so. Now, coming down here to the bottom, focus on another subject. Madge had a lot of medical issues, and one of the most amazing things about Madge is what she overcame. 
this is a woman who suffered a stroke at the age of 30, lost the use of a hand, lost a foot to tuberculosis. That's a foot brace that she wore. Um, so she suffered a great deal. Um, she was a, a supporter of the of sufferers of tuberculosis. This is these are pictures of a sanatorium that she founded out. It was out Georgetown Road near New Circle Road, um, and many of the buildings were designed by Magdalene Harvey McDowell, especially the children's building. And you can see here they're trying to raise money, and they put fifty five thousand on that building and fifty five thousand on that building. So uh, trying to raise some significant money. These cups were used. Uh, at water fountains and things like that to present, prevent the spread of tuberculosis. So something to think about as we go through a pandemic today, they were making these efforts at that time to be sanitary. And those are receipts from prescriptions of matches um, from mostly drug stores here in town. Um, you see she's using a, uh, that acetonolid is like acetaminophen. That one's got codeine in it, so variety of medical things. Incidentally, you see McAdams and Morford. That drug store existed in downtown Lexington for a very long time. I actually remember when I was in junior high, this would have been about 1984, my sister and I took the bus downtown and uh, my mother was working at the time as an attorney at a big firm downtown. We met her and she took us to lunch at the lunch counter at McAdams and Morford, McAdams and Morford which was a remarkable experience. So anyway, Oh, it's interesting that she went there. Madge died November 23rd, 1920. This section of the newspaper was put out December the 5th. December the 3rd. No, 5th. I can't read it. <laughs> December of uh, 1920 in the Lexington Herald, which was edited by her husband. And it's a, a whole section of the paper devoted to her and her life and has all sorts of testimonials in it. Um, it's a really fascinating document. We have a number of copies. We actually have a whole box full of them that are still wrapped, that are still just the way they were when they came out that day. And it's pretty remarkable. Um, but she was widely uh, mourned at her passing. And Sophie Nisbur, her sister-in-law, wrote a book about her. It's the first book written about her. There's a second now written by Melba Porter Hay, which we sell, which is a really, really great biography if you wish to know more. So as you go forward... As we approach the election, remember what Madge did. I mean, it's had some tremendous effects. You can see here we've had several legislators. Catherine Langley was the first female legislator uh, in our federal legislature. She served in Congress in uh, 1927. Uh, she served until 1931. Ann Northrop served from 97 to 2006. So we've had two members of the House. We have no senators yet. Uh, we had one female governor, Martha Lane Collins, and Kelly Knightcraft, who was at the time we did the exhibit ambassador to Canada and is now uh, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. These are all Kentucky women. Um, obviously, as we approach the centennial, it's interesting to note that we have a woman as a candidate for vice president. So it'll be interesting to watch the election. And I urge all of you to go out and vote. Whatever you wish to vote, vote. It is a sacred American right, one that a lot of people have fought for, people like Madge. So by all means, go out and do it. That incidentally is Breckenridge Elementary. That's here in town. Uh, that was named for Madge. It opened shortly after the Lincoln School closed in 1967 or thereabouts in the 60s, actually opened in 63. Uh, it's still there, um, still educating students. Uh, not very far from Ashland, actually. So she has a school name for her, and that's really great. Are there any questions about Madge or about suffrage? Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Again, there's lots of material on the website. Thanks to Kate Heil, who is our friendly neighborhood web slinger. Um, it looks great. Enjoy that. Thank you, and have a good day, and we'll be back next week. Have a good week. Thank you. Goodbye.